what we can do is we can, uh, can give you a little presentation first, talking about the issues with chronic inflammation and how we have developed a series of tools to uh, prevent excessive inflammatory stress. Um, or we can simply make this a question and answer session. I mean, it's, I'm very versed, I'm very flexible. We can do this whichever way you prefer. Yeah, for us it's uh, better because all of us were uh, very new here. Uh, we are in the company only some weeks and uh, we of course present the, the, the idea and the products in, in the doctors. But it's better to, mm -hmm. if we can have a, a small presentation in the start, it's better. And then we can uh, discuss uh, some things uh, uh, that any, any, anybody of the audience can ask. Okay, that's fine. Look, in that case, uh, I'm sharing my screen with you now. You should have the first slide of a PowerPoint, which yeah. is titled Diet, Inflammation and Death. Do you want to have that? Yeah, we can see it. Okay. Um, let's talk to begin with about why we have such poor uh, public health at the moment. Um, and I'll talk very quickly about the impact of increasing uh, BMR, waist size, body weight, however you want to think of this. Um, it's very well known that just about every nation on earth at the moment has experienced a, a, a sustained increase in average weight. And I always make the point that this is not something that I blame on individuals. Modern uh, humans are penalized in various ways. Firstly, we uh, live a rather inactive lifestyle because of modern technology. But secondly, we are being uh, surrounded by a food environment, which is very unhelpful. Processed foods, which tend to be calorie dense and nutrient light, and which are actually designed to be addictive and to override our normal uh, satiety impulses. And so it's very easy for people to get heavier. And as we get heavier, the risk of many different pathologies increases. And I've listed some of them here. This is not a comprehensive list. Uh, I'll simply talk briefly about NIDDM or type 2 diabetes. And the point I want to make is that not only are the chronic degenerative diseases in general becoming more frequent, but we also see them occurring in progressively younger groups of subjects. And so that while um, I was taught at medical school in the 60s that type 2 diabetes was a disease of old age, uh, you are very familiar, I'm sure, with this problem surfacing in uh, pre-adolescent patients. And that is an acceleration of the aging process, even if you use anti-diabetic medications. Uh, we know that the increase in late-stage complications, which uh, include everything from heart disease and stroke to a range of cancers, blindness, kidney and liver disease, all of those uh, increase and effectively reduce life expectancy by about eight years. So type 2 diabetes is a very good example of a disease that has become vastly more frequent since 1950 and where the latency has decreased younger and younger patients. And keep that in mind, that's the very common pattern that we see with many other chronic degenerative diseases. So along with the increase in diabetes, we're seeing huge increases in non-alcohol related fatty liver disease and end stage renal disease. Uh, hypertension and cataracts because of course cataracts are more frequent in diabetics and because diabetes is occurring in younger ages uh, the age of onset of cataracts has actually fallen by 20 years uh, in approximately the last half century not only more cases to treat progressively younger the same is true for diseases affecting the central nervous system so the dementias in general have increased by about 300% since 1950 in frequency. And if you go to number three here, this little section here, since 1980, the average age of the start of dementia has fallen by 15 years. Uh, and because people are starting to dement progressively earlier, we see that uh, as the disease progresses, we see more people dying. Uh, in the 75-year-old age group plus, we've seen neurodegenerative deaths increasing 300% in women and 500% in men. And I've linked this with depression because depression is now really understood to be a, a 
a neuroprogressive disease. In other words, the depression itself actually causes brain damage, which tends to be why depressive illness tends to become more severe. The attacks become more frequent with time. And the concern here is that depression is also becoming more frequent, doubling approximately every generation. And if you look here, the age of onset, like that of dementia, has fallen by 15, 16 years, um, really in, in, in the last 30 years. Uh, this means we're going to see even more patients with early stage dementia as we go forwards. And if you look at problems of the central nervous system, not in uh, later ages, but at the youngest ages, neurodevelopmental uh, problems, the whole range of them have also increased really quite dramatically. So what we're beginning to, the picture I'm trying to create for you is one where multiple pathologies are increasing in frequency, decreasing in latency, indicating an environmental intoxication. And we see that also in terms of connective tissue. Uh, there is a lot of evidence that our skeletal integrity has been damaged by something in the environment, as has our cartilage. Now, the increase in hip and knee replacements is undoubtedly partly because we are becoming heavier, putting more load on weight-bearing joints. But there's evidence that cartilage chemistry is also degraded over the last generation. More problems of uh, the immune system. The increase in allergy is extremely well known and uh, is overwhelming, frankly, in Britain, our ability to cope with it and the situation is not much better here. Uh, autoimmune diseases, which are slightly different, but still involving the immune system, increasing all of them at about three or 4% a year. And there's hundreds of these uh, attacking many different potential target tissues. All of them are increasing in the same way. Cancers, uh, there's a new, an immune system component here as well, but we're really talking about a different type of uh, category of disease. The non-tobacco related cancers have doubled since 1950, and non-tobacco related lung cancer has doubled since 2012. The numbers aren't huge, but the trend is extremely alarming. And it's not because we're getting older as a society. We see the same doubling of cancer in teenagers and young adults. And one cancer in particular, bowel cancer, in young adults, is 22 to 37 year olds, has quadrupled since 1974. Again, relatively small numbers, but highly significant increase. Now, all these diseases have long latency periods. In other words, you will lose bone for decades before a fracture occurs. You grow atheroma for decades before a heart attack. So if the numbers of people presenting with clinical disease are increasing like this, what is happening in what we think are the healthy population, but really in the most cases, what we find when we examine them, they're not healthy at all. They have these diseases too, but in a preclinical or latent form. So when we study groups of healthy young adults, we find that about a fifth have, the, have a, a chronic liver disease, um, about uh, between a quarter and a third of them uh, have the osteoporosis, uh, between a fifth and a quarter of them have coronary artery disease, that's the endothelial dysfunction, and we see about 5%, one in five are showing signs of they're starting to dement, they're losing brain cells, they have ARCD, age-related cognitive decline. So in other words, it's getting very difficult to find healthy populations. I'm not even sure they exist anymore. And the evidence is pretty clear. This is a large, very large global study that's carried out, and uh, Pretty much every year, the result comes out the same. Poor diet is the biggest cause of early death. It's not only making us sick, it's making us stupid. The brain is uh, very vulnerable to environmental toxins and nutritional issues because it has multiple dependencies. And this meta-analysis shows that since 1950, our average IQ has dropped by about 15 points. This is the sum of many, many different studies that have been done, carried about by Demini, who's one of our leading experts in intelligence measurement and his colleagues at the University of Alster in Brussels. We also see progressive declines in sperm counts and just as we saw here there's no evidence of any stabilization. The latest data says we've lost another couple of IQ points even since uh, 2016 when the last papers came out. Even in, in the last three years we've seen a further loss of between a point and a point and a half. And the same with sperm counts, they're falling have been so for at least 1970. There's some evidence they started falling a little below before that. And this meta-analysis takes into account both uh, international studies and intranational studies in many different parts of the globe. 
the, the trends are very clear. And what they say is we've lost almost two thirds of our average sperm count within the last generation. And at the clinical end, we are seeing increasing numbers of males presenting with subfertility or um, frank clinical infertility. And this is where um, a lot of these things seem to come from. Um, bad food, bad nutrition is the problem. And that nutritional nexus is right here. This is what happens inside your immune cells. This is a macrophage, but it could be a neutrophil. Um, it, it could be various other types of uh, immune cells. And rather than going into the whole of this diagram, which is quite complex, uh, very endlessly fascinating, but very complex, I'm going to concentrate on the inflammasome, which is what happens once the cell has decided to be inflammatory, and I'll show you how it actually leads to tissue damage. Now, when I move this pointer around, can you see it on your screens? You can, okay. I just want to um, point out to you, there's a couple of things up here. If you have tissue damage, um, which might be triggered by a reactive oxygen species. And there you have damage. These are damps, which are uh, damage associated molecular patterns. Um, I'll also throw in PAMPs, which are pathogen associated molecular patterns. If you have damage or invasion by a pathogen, you want inflammation. That's why you have all this machinery. Um, but this inflammation sequence, if it's limited to resolving damage or getting rid of a pathogen, that's fine. But if it's constantly being stimulated by things like this, and this is the age rage reaction, which is caused by our modern diet, um, then you have too much inflammation, far more than you want. Then let's see what happens here, which is where the immune cells actually cause inflammation, which causes tissue damage, which leads to degenerative disease. That's the sequence of cause and events. But quite quickly start to show you the good side and the bad side of inflammation if you have a, a pathogen or disease or damage to the tissues, and that's here, the end challenge, you need to be able to start the inflammation sequence, and that involves omega-6s, that's where arachidonic acid comes in. And you also, once the threat has been dealt with, you need to switch it off with things like uh, resolvins and protectins, and they come from the omega threes. So you have to have the right balance between sixes and threes. This is like the acceleration on the car, which starts the inflammation, this is like the break which stops it. So you need to have the right ratios of sixes to threes. And that comes in here. The inflammasome, which is where the immune cells start to cause tissue damage, is a simple system in, well, I can show it in a simple way, um, where it's effectively a two-stage sequence. In the first stage of the sequence, once you have an inflammatory stimulus, the cell produces mediators or messenger substances derived from omega-6s and omega-3s. And if you have too much 6s and not enough 3s, and that's very common now, the cell starts to release particles, microstructures, will, uh, they're, they're sort of broadly called exosomes. And those exosomes then break down and they release a group of enzymes called matrix metalloproteases. And these enzymes are very destructive. They destroy the extracellular matrix and basically melt. They erode all bodily tissues. Now, because these enzymes are so destructive, uh, we were designed, and I'm not using the, this in the sense of intelligent design, but we evolved uh, in such a way that we ate a diet containing lots of these compounds, which are polyphenols, which keep the matrix metalloproteases under control and prevent them from wreaking too much destruction. The problem is that we're now eating a diet which has a very high six to three ratio. The data indicates we should be, uh, you know, two, three, or four to one. European average is now 15 to one. So this first part of the inflammasome is overheating. And then the second problem is that the modern diet has removed these compounds, the polyphenols, they've gone. So the second part of the chamber is overheating as well, releasing lots of these matrix metalloproteases, causing tissue destruction. And they destroy this, the extracellular matrix, which is a mesh of microfibers that runs through your body, every cubic millimeter of your body holding your cells together so that they can coordinate and function collectively. So you've got collagen in here, many different kinds of collagen, elastin, laminectin, proteoglycans, glycosamine, many different fibers. This is a very complicated structure or organ. It's an organ in its own right. But the matrix metalloproteases dissolve all of them. <clears throat> now here is uh, where we have come from. We've come as best, as best we can uh, understand 
throughout most of history, we've consumed omega sixes and threes in a ratio of about maybe one, you know, two to one, three to one. After about 1900, this changes. Omega threes start becoming uh, rather scarcer because seafoods are becoming more expensive. But omega sixes really start to take off because in 1900, the food processing industry develops ways of stabilizing them. And now they start to be added in increasing amounts to processed foods. Polyphenols have declined because um, of the way in which we consume fruits and vegetables far less than we used to. And very often when we eat processed fruits and vegetables, the key tissues where the polyphenols are stored have gone. So for example, in an apple, um, the major concentrations of polyphenols are in the skin to protect the fruit and in the core around the seeds to protect the DNA of the next generation. When you eat a whole apple, you're consuming the polyphenols. But if you eat processed apple, which has been put into an apple pie, for example, or apple juice or apple puree, most of those polyphenols have gone because the processes remove the skin and the core and work just with the pulp of the fruit. So here are the manufacturers. These are the people who <clears throat> uh, basically are poisoning us all. Uh, a lot of apparent variety, but behind that only a very small number of companies. And although none of these foods individually is toxic, collectively they are because they have the wrong six to three ratio. The, six, the, the threes have gone. One anti-inflammatory component is gone. The polyphenols have gone. That's two anti-inflammatory components gone. Prebiotics. And they are very important for stopping inflammation in the large bowel. They've gone. And finally, the 1,316 beta glucans, which are essential for the function of the innate immune system, have gone. More chronic inflammation. So, four key anti inflammatory compounds in the diet have been largely removed. They've been replaced by these advanced glycation and advanced lipo oxidation end products because they're produced when the food industry uses rather high temperature food processing technology. And these are highly pro-inflammatory. And then they fill our foods full of enormous amounts of sugar, uh, sugar everywhere and in places where you least expect it. There's, ketchup is really 30% sugar by weight, but also uh, the wrong electrolytes. Lots and lots of sodium, not enough magnesium, potassium, and this causes further problems. This is a diet that causes the release of matrix metalloproteases slowly into the tissues over time, leading to the slow erosion of bone and cartilage and arterial walls and the slow and cumulative killing off of brain cells. And this is something also that drives cancer. So we fully understand now what it is in our lifestyle and specifically in our diet that causes chronic inflammation. We know how chronic inflammation leads to chronic degenerative disease. And most importantly, we now know how to stop it. But before I leave this topic, I'll just point out that as well as chronic inflammation, we are doubly handicapped because most people today are malnourished. We have malnutrition. Now, this is not the type A, which is typically associated with, uh, let's say, something like an absence of vitamin C um, and not enough calories. And this is what medical people are taught at school. We have type B malnutrition, where people are low in almost every micro and phytonutrient because we're eating very little than the foods that we eat are very nutrient light, but we often have enough of too many calories, and that pretty much looks like that. Now, these are not uh, <laughs> these are not Greeks, I think they're Croats, because the last time I gave this presentation was Croatia, but I could put in an audience of modern or metropolitan or urban Greeks, and the picture would be the same. We know that just about everybody who lives in towns or cities now has chronic malnutrition. Picture slightly different in rural areas. Now, I've said that it's these foods that kill us. We've got a lot of evidence for this. We know that uh, each 10% increase in consumption of processed foods increases the risk of cancer by 10%, early death by 14%. And if you crunch the numbers, if you're eating five or six portions of these processed foods a day, it actually doubles your risk of early, which means unnecessary and preventable death. And we see the same thing in preclinical studies. This last one is a study in lab rats they show just the same problems that we see in humans. And because we are now eating such vast amounts of processed foods, life expectancy is falling. And in the United States, uh, life expectancy has been falling for four years, in Britain for three, and we know that Germany, Ireland, Finland, Poland, Australia will be next because that is where people eat the most of these processed foods. America comes in number one at about um, 
57, 58%. Britain's next at 52%. And then you can see here, Ireland and Germany and Poland and Finland are next. And what we're seeing is as the multinational food companies are driving their junk foods, um, oh, sorry about this, from north to south and from west to east, we're seeing that even in countries like uh, Croatia, Hungary, Greece, and Cyprus, we're seeing the amounts of ultra-processed foods being consumed there increasing. And as they do, and as the classic Mediterranean diet is obliterated, we're seeing the change in body shapes as a result, and the increased pathology is very certainly going to follow them. We're already seeing this in Germany, and it's, as I said, it's spreading uh, east and south. So if you can still find a Mediterranean diet, it's a pretty good thing to switch to that. It's extremely effective, more so than anything that the doctors can offer you. We know that it will reduce the risk of many chronic degenerative diseases by between 30, 40, maybe even 45%. But now we know a better approach. This is the 19th century diet, the mid-Victorian diet, which has two causes. One is the agricultural revolution, which increases agricultural productivity by tenfold. And then we have the industrial revolution, which brings all this fresh agricultural produce into the city where people are working. And they're working physically with their backs and their hands. All of this has been tabulated. We know how, how they worked, how long they lived, how long they died. If you measure their physical activity, it works out at about 60 to 75 hours of physical activity a week, which is completely different from what we see today. And because they're burning so many calories, the women about three, three and a half thousand, men up to 7,000, and they're eating lots of food, more than we do, and the food that they do eat is not processed, it's basic. So it's unlike our food, which is calorie dense, nutrient light, there is this calorie light, nutrient dense. So they have a completely different nutritional intake. And because there's no processed foods, and because at that time, seafood is very cheap, they had, we estimate, a six to three omega ratio that was well below five and probably closer to three and lots of polyphenols. So no chronic inflammation. It's a fantastically good diet. Now remember they had no modern drugs, no modern surgery, no modern hospitals, no modern medicine at all. But when we look at life expectancy and you have to do a culturally appropriate, a class appropriate comparison, we can see that mid-Victorian women lived to an average of 73. Their equivalents today live to 76. Actually, that's fallen, that is now 75. So women have gained two years because of better obstetrics and gynecology and family planning. But look down here, men have actually lost three years of life expectancy. Despite the whole of 20th century medicine, they've gone backwards. And not only have they lost life expectancy, they've lost health expectancy. If you look down here, we know that when the elderly in the second half of the 19th century became too infirm to work in factories or fields, they were sent to the workhouses and they had to work to pay for their own upkeep. We know that they were able to do so in a way that people today could not. And then we analyze what they died of. It's almost all infection. They did have cancer, heart disease and diabetes, but it was very rare. About 10% of the figures we see today is in a population that lived about as long. Other people have also tabulated these figures, and here you have cancer and vascular diseases killing about two-thirds of us, but at that time they only kill about, instead of 66%, maybe about 6%. So their chronic degenerative diseases were recognized, diagnosed at the point of death, and yet very rare, only about 10% of what we see today. And that tells us, firstly, that 90% of the burden of chronic degenerative disease we see today is avoidable. And that other 10% who are still dying of those things, even although they had an anti-inflammatory diet, we now understand that they were the 10% who have strong genetic risk factors. We can go into this in detail. This is a breakdown of why they had very little cancer and we, uh, we, have, we are overwhelmed by cancer. I won't go into this in a particular detail unless you have any doctors or medical personnel are who are interested, but the point is the Victorians were, com were protected in many, many different ways. And we are absolutely vulnerable in many, many different ways. So if cancer cells are forming in our bodies all the time, um, in the Victorian, those cancer cells have got nowhere to go. 
that Victoria is very, very protected. Whereas if that cancer cell forms in a modern body, it's that one spark will cause a fire. Uh, we're that much more vulnerable. So here we have um, Mr. Everyman. Uh, let's say he's a 21st century person and he's eating a diet with lots of processed foods, which means that he has a six to three ratio of about 15 to one and very little polyphenols in his diet, which means he's going to have chronic inflammation in all sorts of tissues and he's going to have a lot of chronic degenerative disease involving those tissues. But he's also eating a diet without prebiotic fiber, which means that in the colon, the large bowel here, the gram-positive anaerobes are being starved and their place in the microbiome is being taken over by gram-negative bacteria. Now, not all gram-negative bacteria are bad, not all gram-positive bacteria are good, but gram-negative are negative because they are coated in lipopolysaccharide, which is highly pro-inflammatory. So if you take away the prebiotic fibers, the microbiome shifts to being gram negative, and now you have chronic inflammation in the gut as well, which makes everything worse. So we give these people balance oil, which combines omega-3s with lipid-soluble polyphenols, and that switches off inflammation very effectively in most tissues. But we then feed them uh, prebiotic fibers to change the microbiome and switch it back from gram negative to gram positive. And when we do that, the inflammation in the colon disappears as well. And that has an additional anti-inflammatory effect elsewhere in the body. Just to bring you up to speed as to how this works, this is what the microbiome looks like in the gut of someone eating a traditional diet, lots of prebiotic fiber. And that feeds the gram positive bacteria, here they're in green, and they tend to live in the lumen of the gut and in the outer mucosal layer. And they communicate with the colonocytes and the colonocytes talk back to them. It's a two-way conversation. And broadly speaking, what this conversation is saying, the bacteria are saying to our cells, don't be inflamed and do not be cancerous. But if you take prebiotics out of the diet, now the gram positive bacteria are starved, they're replaced by gram-negative strains here in red, and they erode the mucosal layers. They come into direct contact with the cells that line the colon, and the conversation now is very adversarial. It's very hostile. These bacteria are saying to our cells, be inflamed and be cancerous. One reason why we have so much IBS and IBD today. So what we do, we put the prebiotic fibers back into the diet, feed the barium-positive bacteria, they take over, they kill off the gram-negative bacteria, and once again, the inflammation goes away. You are now back to normal because the amount of lipopolysaccharide in the walls of the gram-negative microbes is reduced dramatically. But when you feed probi prebiotics to these probiotic species, they break down those prebiotic fibers into butyrate, where a short-chain fatty acid, which is a powerful anti-inflammatory compound, which is also very good at killing cancer cells, by the way. Typical prebiotic, very short chain. Um, bacteria eat, uh, they chew it up one sugar moiety after another, so they eat them in linear fashion. And because these molecules are very short, the fermentation is a rapid one. So we only use a small amount of these compounds and we uh, combine them with larger amounts of inulin, very similar molecule, but longer, so the fermentation is slower. Larger amounts of the oat beta glucans, larger molecule, slower fermentation again. And finally, we uh, complete the package with a very complex fiber, which is resistant starch, where the fermentation is very slow indeed. And the reason for combining them, everything in the gut is, is moving. It's moving. And so when the mixture uh, first enters the gut, the first fibers that uh, start to ferment and start to move the microbiome from negative to positive are the very rapid fermenting FOS. They quickly are used up and then the inulin takes over and then the larger amounts of 1, 3, 1, 4 beta glucans take over. It's, it's very like a relay race. And finally, the resistant starch completes the process. And in this way, we shift the balance of the microbiome from negative to positive through the whole of the large bowel. So how important is that? Well, the WHO meta-analysis published just two and a half months ago says that if you increase your fiber intake, it reduces preventable death by 30%. And here 
is some of the breakdown. Um, and they say, well, about 30 grams a day is your entry level dose, but if you eat more, you get more protection. But the problem is nobody eats enough fiber. Nine out of 10 don't eat enough. What the average actually is, is about 15, which is half of what the World Health Organization says is the entry level dose. Now there's lots of fibers, different fibers, most of which have no effect at all. The ones you really need are the prebiotic fibers and the average diet, which contains 15 grams of total fiber, only a quarter of that is prebiotic. So we think that the WHO data imply that you should be eating seven grams of these mixed fibers and we put 12 grams into one dose of xenobiotic and we find that this basically stops inflammatory stress in the large bowel extremely quickly and very, very thoroughly. Now there's two other sources of chronic inflammation in the body and one of those is deep abdominal fat. Now you know that the apple shape is more dangerous than the pear shape and that's because deep abdominal fat has a tendency to become infiltrated with macrophages which set up foci of inflammation and cause problems elsewhere. You can reduce this inflammation by losing that deep body fat, by taking lots of exercise and starving yourself. Difficult to do. So we know of another way, which was developed by universities at uh, the Free University of Paris. Some very good scientists there showed that you could switch off this kind of chronic inflammation with a group of fat-soluble phytonutrients, including uh, tocotrienols, um, various carotenoids and xanthophils and lipid soluble polyphenols, all of which we have put into extend. So that is a way of switching off that inflammation. And the last kind of sort of the source of chronic inflammation is periodontal disease. Very, very common. Uh, and because it's in the mouth, very close to the brain in most people, um, we think this is why it's associated with an increased risk of uh, neurodegenerative conditions, including Alzheimer's and Parkinsonism. There's a lot of biochemistry to support this. Um, and because they're in the mouth and in the saliva, you swallow those inflammatory toxins, and this increases the risk of breast cancer, prostate cancer, and resistant hypertension. So that spot of blood in the sink when you brush your teeth is actually something potentially serious and something you should work on. Now, improved oral hygiene is one thing, but we found another very easy tool to use to to um, treat this as well. We find it in edible seaweed. Uh, now Greece has lots and lots of islands, lots of coastlines, so I think every Greek person knows that when you pick seaweed up out of the ocean, it's very slippery. The reason why it's slippery is that these seaweeds contain large amounts of fucodans and funerans. They're nonstick compounds, the biological equivalent of Teflon. When you eat these, and there are plenty of edible seaweeds, one of which we like is Ascophyllum nodosum, then you um, absorb these compounds, they get into the saliva, and they coat the roots of the teeth in these nonstick compounds. And when you do that, plaque disappears very quickly, and you can measure this for yourself using plaque disclosing tablets. And then after two to three weeks, the tartar just drops off the roots of your teeth. And when that happens, the gums stop bleeding, periodontal disease stops, chronic inflammation in the mouth also stops. And when that happens, we think that the risk factors for Alzheimer's, Parkinsonism, and breast cancer and prostate cancer and all the rest linked to periodontal disease also go away. So we have a systemic approach to inflammation in the tissues, this combination of omega-3s and fat-soluble polyphenols in the gut, blended prebiotic fibers. In deep fat and periodontal disease, we have Extend, which contains all the cofactors necessary to stop inflammation in those sources, plus a very comprehensive micro and phytonutrient support program designed to treat and reverse type B malnutrition. All of these products can be used individually. They all are effective on their own. They work best, I think, when they're combined because when you do that, you are doing two things, three things. You are stopping chronic inflammatory stress in all of the important sites in the body. You're providing with Extend all the cofactors that the body needs to upregulate and facilitate its processes of healing and regeneration. All the cofactors are there. Um, and what we see, I mean, in, in, in tens of thousands of, of cases now, that uh, chronic degenerative diseases initially, they slow, they go into, they stabilize, they start to go, they go into remission, and then 
we actually begin, we see now, and this was very surprising to us in the early days, now it's really quite routine. We see uh, many signs of the underlying disease itself going into reverse. Um, so it's quite clear, I think, by now, that chronic degenerative disease is not in, an intrinsic part of aging. It's in fact, it's caused by chronic inflammation and this metabolic starvation. Put those things right, and the matrix, the extracellular matrix, which underlies all of these tissues, instead of eroding, starts to regenerate. So I'll just give you one example, but I could give you, as I said, thousands actually by now. My fiance, when I met her, had um, osteoporosis, diagnosed by dual beam excitometry, and, um, which is the gold standard, as you know. And she was uh, in her mid 60s and was uh, clearly at risk because she'd had um, uh, an ovariectomy at a quite an early age uh, and was part. Um, I put her on a routine like this and uh, it's now four years on. She went from osteoporosis to osteopenia and now she has normal bone mineral density. So this is heresy if you speak to a, a classically trained doctor uh, or clinical scientist, which I used to be, but this new understanding of the relationship between nutritional status, inflammatory stress, the health of the extracellular matrix, and the progress or reversal of chronic degenerative symptomology has now been worked out to the point where really it's, 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 it's clear, it's logical, and is evidenced in increasing numbers of, uh, of patients. We have ethics committee approval to go to a full-scale prospective randomized clinical trial early in the new year. And at that point, we will be shifting from our case histories to a very much more substantial form of data, uh, which we hope to publish in a very high profile medical journal indeed. And we hope that this will begin to persuade uh, more doctors to come and work with us. We already have large numbers who've seen the results of these interventions in their patients, but we would like to effectively re-educate the entire medical profession. Uh, that's one of our rationales for doing the clinical trial. So at this point, let me kill that presentation. I don't think uh, we need any more of that. And I can um, answer uh, whatever questions you might yeah, like Paul, to address to me. Paul, I, uh, thank you, Paul. Um, my name is Jans. I'm based in Oslo, Norway. Uh, we didn't get a proper introduction before before the meeting and I, I've been working with, with Paul as a Cicino together with the rest of the Cicino partners all over Europe for a few years now and uh, have the honor to get the knowledge and, and help from, from him. We see that more and more people are joining us in health and, and nutrition areas. And uh, I got a question here, Paul, because right now we have done, uh, I think, 340,000 tests. Mm. On, uh, on, on the balance and on the fatty acids, and we have approximately 200,000 customers on our product. Could you tell mm. us just a little more about uh, our test? How is that working? Uh, okay, this is a very simple um, do-it-yourself test. You can take a lancet, uh, prick the finger, a couple of bloods on a piece of drops of blood on a litmus paper, um, you then dry it, seal it, send it off to a validated third party independent laboratory. And using your code, you then go online a couple of weeks later and you'll get a full profile of the lipid chemistry of your cell membranes. Um, we are, we're not the only people uh, who are doing this. This is a research tool that's used by many clinical scientists, but our library is probably uh, 20 times larger than that of any other research group. So we, we're now effectively, we, they are, we are the experts in this. What we find is that um, the average six to three ratio in erythrocyte cell membranes in Europe is now 15 to one. In North America, it's 25 to one. And it matches exactly the different intakes of processed foods and the increased incidence of degenerative disease. This is a very good marker, very heavily weighted. Um, in the next generation of this test, we will also, uh, I think, be able to measure vitamin D. We'll also, more importantly, I believe, be able to measure um, polyphenols in the like protein components. Um, and that will give us an additional insight into that person's uh, degree of inflammatory stress. Um, we're not quite there yet, 
the technology involved is very much very complicated and state of the art and getting it to the point where we can um, automate it to process tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of samples uh, it, it's it, it's complicated but we're working on it we should be there midway through 2020 so what we basically do is that we do the first test on a person we send the blood, blood sample to the laboratory and then we get the answer back, we get an 11 page show, you get all the nutrition facts, you, you treat one, you do balance between omega-6 and omega-3, your cell number and so and so on. And then after 120 days, we test the customer again. And uh, then we will see a whole other result because we see that we bring a person in balance, uh, in a perfect balance, actually 95% of them after 120 days on a ratio between omega-6 and omega-3. And there was a question here, Paul, why is our product working so much better than most products in the market uh, regarding to get a person in balance in 120 days? Well, the answer is, uh, well, I'll give you the answer in stages. One of the things that we uh, that surprised us when we first started doing this, we we're testing the blood samples of a lot of people who were already taking fish oil. And we expected to see that they would have rather better results than they did. But in fact, we find that people taking fish oil, even quite large doses, maybe they're better than 15 to one. They may be 12 to one, 11 to one, 10 to one, nine to one, eight to one, but they're still not down at the five to one ratio where chronic inflammatory stress starts to uh, become damped. And we, um, spent quite a lot of time um, trying to analyze this and we came back to where we started. It turns out that most commercial fish oils don't deliver omega-3 very effectively to the peripheral tissues because they use the wrong antioxidant. They use typically vitamin E, which firstly is not very good at protecting omega-3 from oxidative stress and you know, the Sintep, which is a Norwegian uh, governmental organization has demonstrated this. And that's partly because omega-3 under many conditions flips over to become a pro-oxidant. But the second problem with vitamin E is that it's not what nature designed to do the job. It's not a good chaperone. Um, the omega-3s that you see in fish are not made by the fish. They're made by the cold water seaweeds. So in the same way that terrestrial plants are the source of all omega-6s on land, it's the deep the cold water seaweeds that are the source of all the omega-3s in the marine food chain. And you have to ask yourself, how is it that the omega-3s, which are very fragile molecules, can travel from the seaweeds to the krill, to the pelagic fish, the big fish, the marine mammals, and then finally the apex predator, which could be you or it could be the inuit, a process which takes up to 18 months. These are very fragile molecules. How could they do that? Vitamin E can't do that. The answer is simple. The seaweeds, which make the omega-3s, also make lipid-soluble polyphenols, which act as chaperones for the omega-3s. They travel with the omega-3s all the way through the marine food chain until they get to the humans who eat the oily fish. And in fact, in nature, you never find the omega-3s on their own. They're always accompanied by these, flora, by these lipid-soluble polyphenols. They're, they're married together. When we take omega-3s and polyphenols together, the polyphenols chaperone the omega-3s all the way through from your stomach to the small intestine, to the portal circulation, to the liver, and then the peripheral tissues and deliver them in a way that vitamin E can't. And then when the polyphenols finally arrive in the peripheral tissues, they have this other function, which is they're anti-inflammatory. So the, the polyphenols, the lipid soluble polyphenols, and there aren't many of them, are the ideal um, congeners for omega-3. They are the right chaperone and they have anti-inflammatory activity which complements the omega-3s. So what we see in our hundreds of thousands of subjects is that as their 6 to 3 ratio falls, the symptoms that they have, which might be pain, might be uh, stiffness, they might be hypertension, they might be psoriasis, those symptoms gradually reduce in parallel with the reduction in the six to three ratio. So here we've got a situation where the mechanism of action, the clinical presentation change in parallel. It's, it's extremely convincing. Some of you may have seen this already for yourselves, but if you haven't, I would just say, um, 
find out for yourselves. I'm, um, I, I've been reading a lot of tests with people. Uh, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a medical person. Uh, I'm helping people do that test and, and we read that test together afterwards. Uh, but as mm. a doc, as a doctor, uh, you do this test of a patient on a person that know you are a doctor. How would you read that test to a, to a normal person? How would I read it? Yeah, how would you, okay, well, how would you that... explain it, would you explain <laughs> it to, to a normal okay. person? Uh, I don't know, I know how I would, but I'm not yet. a doctor. <laughs> 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 well, the question I got, Paul, was how, how, how should the doctor read the test to, to his patient? And I know that we are a little into how we are working and we are testing people and we are reading okay. the test. And to read the test is not that difficult, but you as a doctor, would you do anything special? Would you, I mean, as a doctor, well, read the test in any way? Yeah, I think there's different things you could say. You could say, well, some doctors measure um, plasma lipids, but that's really not very useful because they change after every meal. What we're doing here is we're looking at the profile of fatty acids in your cell membranes, which is a very accurate measurement of the ratio of sixes and threes in your diet over the long term. So it's much more informative. It's much more useful. And if you have an excess of six to three in the diet, this will show as an excess of six to three in the cell membranes. If you have that, you are more likely to have chronic inflammation in your body. And the higher the ratio, the more likely you are, and the more severe that inflammation will be. That creates a risk over the long haul of disease. It's better to stop that. And it's better to stop that inflammatory stress by bringing the six to three ratio down by taking this combination of omega-3s and lipid-soluble polyphenols, you can do that. And as you do, whatever symptoms you might have of inflammation will fade and in many cases disappear. And it's, it's that simple. Okay. Uh, thank you, Paul. Um, uh, Dimitri, uh, Stelios, uh, I don't have any more questions in English directly from you now. So if you will take over from here, or maybe one of the doctors on the meeting would add us a question directly. Okay, I already text to the doctors to uh, have, if you, they have a question, we can hear this. Uh, I, I have a, a question uh, from last two days about the qualification about heavy metals. Yes. Of the product. And uh, some of the doctors import themselves some uh, omega-3 oils from Canada and uh, yep. from uh, this place there is an IFOS qualification. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, there is a question, why not IFOS? Well, there are different levels, there are different standards set by different countries. Um, you have IFOS, IFOM, I mean there's a whole range of other ones and they're really, they're not very far apart. If you meet most of the international standards, which we do, um, really that's enough because you're going to be exposed to heavy metals in higher concentrations and in more significant amounts in many other foods. So, I mean, to me, it doesn't make sense really to strain at a gnat. Um, and in any case, if the Canadian product uh, is not using the right uh, chaperone compound, it's not going to work. Uh, it simply won't. It won't be capable of delivering the omega-3s in sufficient amounts to the peripheral tissues to bring down that critical 6 to 3 ratio. So it may theoretically be, you know, a few percent cleaner. Uh, it's hard to measure except using analytical, forensic analytical technology. And in real life, the clinical impact of this is negligible. But as I said, if you're not using the right chaperones, it's not going to have any therapeutic effect at all. So the therapeutic index of that Canadian material uh, is infinitely less. So it's, uh, again, I think, fairly straightforward. Okay, thank you very much for the answer. It was something I thought. And uh, we don't have any other question. Uh, I, I, I would speak in Greek. Αν κάποιος έχει μια ερώτηση, μπορεί να πατήσει το χεράκι στην πάρα και είναι, είναι still text, μήνυμα. Ε, βέβαια, η παρουσίαση ήταν πάρα πολύ αναλυτική και εσείς, ειδικά εσείς που έχετε, είστε γιατροί, σίγουρα έχετε καταλάβει πολύ περισσότερα από μένα. 
que aquí ya me lo cometen a, a nadie. Eh, ok, Mr. Clayton, we don't have any, any more questions because you, were, you, you was very analytical and the, the, the information was very impressive, all the information for us. Well, I mean, if you haven't any more questions at all, I mean, uh, please don't be um, frightened about being aggressive, hostile, telling me where you think I'm wrong. I, I welcome debate um, and, and I'm not here. You should be skeptical. Doctors should always be skeptical. So if you have any other questions, if there's something that you feel I haven't answered, please be, um, let me know. I'm here to answer any question you might have. Okay. Maybe we can wait uh, some seconds and maybe we can choose one of them to, to push, to make a question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, I'm sure uh, because nobody uh, asking something, uh, we have a lot, a lot of uh, very good doctors in uh, our uh, audience now. And uh, I'm very happy to about this. They, uh, the product is very, very powerful, the product. Uh, I already use this for some weeks, and only in these weeks I have, the, I feel the difference. I feel the difference in my body. And uh, we will uh, try to introduce this product to all the Greeks now. Now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that especially, especially for the doctors um, who are my colleagues and who I respect and want to, to, to uh, communicate with, um, I've given you a very uh, brief uh, overview of, of some of the things that we're doing. But if you are, would like to know more about the detail, if you would like to know more about some of the original research and the references, um, Jens, you, you know that we have a book, Out of the Fire, which has a very extensive bibliography. I think it's close to 2,000 references, which you can use if you wish to jump into the literature and look at the science that underpins what we do. Um, Jens, if you can find a way of uh, getting those books to people who want them. Uh, we have it currently in 23 languages, I think. I'm not sure if that includes Greek, but I know we have it in English and possibly in Greek as well. Um, and if we don't have it in Greek and if there's a demand, please talk to Andrei Algoulis in Lithuania and eventually he should be able to produce that for you. So he, he, will, he will have that in English, no, in Greek, if, it, if it's there? Well, if, if it is in Greek, then, um, then Andrew will, will know how to get it to you. Um, it is okay. certainly it is certainly in English, and what he will do if there is enough of a demand for it in Greek, then he will arrange to have it translated. Okay, okay. so I will I make sure uh, the books are going to to Greek yeah, in one or the other way, and and then we will uh, hopefully in the future there will be a big need for 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 translations if it's not already done. Right? Did you oh, get I, some I, more? I do hope. I do hope that the, the Greek um, project develops because uh, I, I, I'm, I love Greece very much and I would like to have an excuse to come back there uh, and, and meet uh, some of the doctors in person. So that, that is what we have been um, talking about, getting you down there. Uh, when we have uh, enough people in the room, we would love to, to put up a, a seminar with you from where somewhere in the start of next year hopefully you can find the time to to um, drop by Appen, uh, for example for for a day and we can do do a seminar with you wait, wait a minute yes we have a question finally yes. finally wait a minute yes mr daniel. question from daniel question for daniel yes yes wait a minute Daniel, a lot of yes. Mr. Daniel, we can uh, unmute. Just a minute. Okay, we can Is hear you now. We can hear you, you now. Hear yes, Dr. Claydon, a very impressive presentation. I'm not a doctor, but I've been studying uh, nutrition for many years, 40 mm -hmm. years maybe. Mm -hmm. um, you said something about reversing cirrhosis through some of your products. Is this <laughs> yes. Possible? Is this possible? And uh, did, did you 
the line is not so good. Did you say atherosis, atheroma? Cirrhosis, cirrhosis, liver cirrhosis. Oh, no, oh, liver cirrhosis. Yes, 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 of course it is. Um, this is a chronic inflammatory condition par excellence. And if we can alleviate the inflammatory stress and do one or two other things as well, then, uh, then this um, uh, NAFLD and its precursor, NASH, can most definitely be reversed. Really? Wow. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh -huh. Yes. I mean, <laughs> Could we have your presentation, please? Is it possible for you to send us a link about your presentation? Um, I tell you what I can do. I can send this uh, as an attachment or a link to Jens. And Jens, can you make it available to anyone who wants it? Yes. Um, Thank you. Daniel, well, it's my pleasure. Uh, what you'll find is that un in many of the boxes, if you look at the text box underneath the picture, you'll find that in many cases, the original references are there too, that I talk about within the presentation. Okay. Thanks. I, uh, I appreciate that a lot. Thank you very much. You're, you're most welcome. Right. So, Paul, if you just send it to email it, it to me, I will make sure to get the right people. I will. I will. Okay. Yeah. Great. Okay. No more questions. Okay. Okay. So then let's uh, wrap it up then. And I guess uh, Dimitri, Astelios, and the rest of the group uh, now uh, will take this in. Uh, if you want to continue, we'll probably do it in, 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 in Greece. We are in Greek. Uh, we are very excited uh, to, to start and work with you guys. And I'm looking forward to come down myself. And I have uh, thousands of customers also in, uh, in your country in the, in the future. Thank you, Paul, and I'm looking forward to go to, to Athens with you uh, in the near future. And um, uh, Dimitri, do you, you want to take over from here? Yes, yes, yes. All right. Thank you, thank you very much. And uh, okay. I'm happy to have you with us. I will just go. I will just go, and I'll simply say, Afaristo, and I hope to see you soon. Yeah, yeah. Well, good <laughs> night. You. Good night to all. Okay, thank you. Good night. Good night.